Hello and welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast. And this week we have one of the most unique shows I think that I've ever put on. Uh, certainly a happy holiday show for everybody that's got Labor Day coming up. It's Buddy Satello here. And of course, familiar with all of you folks is my good pal J.J. Purdom, who was one on, on one of the first shows. Also, frequent contributor Benny Scala, but I think this is the first time that we've had Dan Sebastiano on, even though I've been a guest on his podcast a couple of times. So welcome, everybody, to Wrestling and Everything, Coast to Coast. Thanks Thank for you for being here. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. So the very first thing, and this is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, we have to discuss it because it's of vital importance, okay? People in the world need to understand that there's a difference between a knee drop and an atomic knee drop. And they don't get the difference. They think it's the same thing. Now, I guess... see atomic knee drops called as knee drops all the time. And no. I see knee drops yeah. called as atomic knee drops all the time. And they yeah. couldn't be more different. What do people expect out of us if they, if they can't get those moves straightened out? Well, Rusters. everybody, what do you have Rusters. to say? There's things that, that make me disgusted in life. And some of them are like, you know, when you leave your kid in the car in a hot car in the summer, that stuff that makes me sick to my stomach. That's not as right? bad. No, not as bad at all. That's where I'm going with this is like there's the atrocities that happen with the Nazis and the Jews. And like, I love your people. I think they are chosen for a reason. Um, but I'll tell you what, I am disgusted at people not knowing the difference between atomic and just a regular old knee drop. There's a huge disparity. How do it's you, how do you struggle blasting. with that? <laughs> And now, and who, had the be- who had the best atomic knee drop ever? That's a good question. I'm going to say Bob Backlund. I, I loved his because he, he got the guy up and then he ran all the way across the ring. I, I would say as, as far as who's got the best one, yeah, that's up for debate. But hands down, no questions asked. No one sold an atomic knee drop like Rick Root. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll challenge that. Greg the Hammer Valentine. When he would get the reverse atomic knee drop, he would do the crotch hold thing and then take a couple steps and then, bam, fall on his face like the tree trunk falling. I love I, that part of it. i got to agree the Rick Rude sell on that it really is the best sell because he's, he's shaking like he's having an orgasm but at the same time holding his lower back. And it's that lower back sell that, like, puts it over the top and makes it, go, oh, thinking. man. I, I, I when, when I was a kid, I called it a nut squasher. The first one I ever saw was Spiros Arion. And that's the first, but oh, I squashed the guy's nuts. Like, Yeah, of course it would hurt. But, you know, it's uh, I, Hogan also did the, the atomic knee drop a lot. That was one of his, you know. And it pissed me off because I, you, when you have a guy back like that, you want to see him do a back suplex and just plant the guy. But instead, usually, you know, the guy oversells it by undersells it by putting his legs down way before he ever gets down on the floor. And then, you know, it doesn't look like it has any impact. But then, you know, guys have to oversell it. Well, that's, that's why Hogan would, would always so Hogan did. would always soften him up with those legendary back rakes. <laughs> yes. The back scratches. The back yeah. scratches. I always felt like that would be my finishing move if I was in if I actually got into the ring. On a permanent basis, I love the I love the back rake, and I thought like, man, Rick Root could sell the hell out of that stuff. You know, just give me an opportunity, I'll back rake the hell out of somebody. Wow, I could see like somebody writing a story. You know, so and so worn out by a series of back rakes, succumbed at the fourteen minute mark, and, and boots to and, and the boot laces to the eyes, just <laughs> alternate. I actually heard that was one of Russ's finishing moves on his wedding. So I don't, yes. Russ, I don't know if you ever shared that on the show or not. But yes. I, oh, you should write an article. You should and write I an threw, article. I threw, I threw uh, a medicine powder into the, uh, into the uh, uh, medicine Well, of course thing. she needed to be blinded, Russ. We knew about that. Oh, okay. Did, you use, it, did you use the grommets when you, when you used the boot laces, though? Because you got to get those in there. Absolutely, yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, but we've never seen a mass wrestler use his laces to, like, blind anybody. You know, that's never been a move there. You know, they've used the boot laces, but never the mass laces. In fact, that was another topic that we were going to bring up was finishing holds. And, 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 you know, first of all, what happened to finishing holds? I mean, they don't exist. They, they, they're, you know, I, no such thing. I would ask what happened to finishers in general, you know? 
you never you, you don't see even the most basic of I want to use main event loosely of of matches that are slightly promoted that don't have at least two or three false finishes. And I get the, um, you know, uh, the bear hug or the big elbow, something that's like the puts them away sometimes, but not always. But you watch it. I mean, Benny, we, we talk about it on our show. And I think, Russ, we, we we've discussed it with you before. It's like, you know, you somebody gets power bombed off the second rope through a flaming table and kicks out at two like that. You know, or he that, just gets you, up, or he just you gets up, burn, like no right. sells it. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> you, you get your head pancaked between a couple of chairs, and ten seconds later, you're you're back in control of the match. But but who in the history of wrestling, say from the fifties to even the mid eighties, like did anybody ever kick out a pole or a pile driver? That, Maybe that was Hogan. a devastating. Maybe Hogan one. did. Hogan yeah. might have. Yeah, he might have been the first one. But yeah. I mean, prior to that, did you ever see anybody kick out of a pile driver? That was it. No. That was that was yeah. finishing. Well, it was a deadly finishing, and, and I mean, look at how Lawler got it over in Memphis. I mean, that to the point where they banned it they in banned the area, it, right? yep. and, and I mean that that got it over too because then the referee's not looking, and he's given the pile driver, and it's like you know that's the finish. Referee turns back around one, two, three. They don't put over finishes the way that they used to, and now I would even say that they do finishes too often to where uh, you you do my finish, I'll do yours three times to you in order to beat you. And it's like, man, I'm so burnt out after a three-hour Raw. I can't sit through three hours of watching guys steal each other's finishers. What I like about Triple H, and since he's taken over Raw, is I think he understands the psychology of wrestling and what I'm noticing him doing on Raw and SmackDown. And it's it's slow. It's not happening overnight. But he's starting to do the thing where when a finish happens, it means something. Now, yeah. if you watched Clash of the Castle, Clash of the Castle last night uh, when they aired it, yeah, there was a couple of, hey, I used your move or whatever. But it's the first time since he took over that I've seen that. And finishes are actually the reason that they're going home now. It's not, hey, he schoolboyed the guy or the, the chick just caught her and she caught one on him. You know, like they're kind of doing away with that. They're definitive victories. And, I, dude, I got to say, I love it. I want to see and more the, of that stuff. The surprise roll-up has been the deadliest move in WWE yeah. for the last 10 years. <laughs> You can see, get more set people on fire lose, and kick more people out of lose. You can't kick out of that roll up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it's it's funny you talk about that. I, I had I remember what was it? Uh not last year, but the year before we had some some friends over for Mania because you know we were still kind of coming out of the COVID thing. And it was uh it was Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. And I think Roman Reigns finally won, but Brock Lesnar had kicked out of like five or six spears. And uh, it's like three or four F fives in the mat, and it was to the point where we're so all sitting there, like, uh, come on, like it, it, you you start getting bored. I mean, it's literally finisher, kick out, breath, rest hold, finisher, kick out, rest, hold, and, and the match gets boring. The finishing moves have become chain moves. That's yeah. what's the problem. Right. Is that is that they they you know what used to be a chain move, which was an arm bar, you know, and a headlock, and you work a, a leg scissors, you know, to to try to maybe get, you know, a toehold in there, something along those lines. I mean, Jesus Christ, when was the last time you saw someone do a short arm scissors, you know? Right. Or you know, the, and, yes. and, and, and remember, like, the, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. I used to love watching the Minnesota Wrecking Crew go to work on... Work the arm. Yeah, work the arm, work the arm, work the arm, and, you know, do, like, eight or nine moves that all involve the arm. Then you really believed it when they would do something major, the arm, you know, and get the arm in, you know, so, so an arm lock or, or an arm bar or something like that. You believe they did the, it for a point because it led to something. And yeah. there was a story told on it and you and and they they worked the arm pretty damn convincingly. You know, I, I think just a couple weeks ago, the AEW main event had a title change, Moxley and Punk. And and the storyline was that CM Punk had hurt his foot, like in one of the very I think second or third move of the match. Moxley attacked the foot, hit him with a couple of DDT. The match was over in like two or three minutes. It was real quick, and you could tell from the fan reaction, it was like, oh my, what was that garbage? This like, like <laughs> you, you you had a story of a guy gets hurt in the beginning of the match, uh, uh, somebody with a, a mean streak attacks the leg for two minutes, beats him one two three, and it's like. Boo, that's stupid. I don't get what happened. And you get the fans genuinely got angry. And it's like you guys have, have it's it's so rare to see a, a a match tell a story that when it did tell a story, fans didn't know what to do with themselves. 
And, and I got to I got to add on to that if that's OK. I, I saw it and I was like, man, that's masterful storytelling. And yes. the way that he the way that he sold it was actually excellent. He didn't sell the foot that he kicked. He sold the foot that he was standing on. So it's like the weight of and he just he came back too early. That's the story they're telling. And it yeah. was like, wow, he's still really good at storytelling for all of that. But then you got people that are, you know, smart marks running around and saying, oh, well, he's been kvetching and he's being uh, he's being beat down by Tony Khan and Tony Khan is punishing him. Look, man, that guy is money. He means ratings. He's not being punished in any way by going out there and telling an excellent story. He wasn't ready. He got caught off guard. He hurt his foot and John Moxley caught him. John Moxley is a winner and a main event guy and a champion and all that. And when he goes into Chicago and ends up triumphing over Moxley in Chicago, it'll be the biggest pop AEW's ever seen. You know, that's yeah. great storytelling. And and he, I think he's he's the only one that can do it because you mentioned his his prowess. I mean, it, it's objective evidence. You can't it's not like an opinion or anything. You can go back and look and CM Punk is the best seller as far as merchandise, ratings, tickets, draw. He's the biggest star the company has. And I think it's telling a couple weeks ago when Kenny Omega was the surprise return in the trios tournament, even though everybody knew it was going to be him and the, the, the punks opened the show million plus by the time Kenny Omega's match started and was over, they had lost something like three or 400,000 viewers. It was like, here's, you know, you could clearly see the difference. Once it was obvious CM Punk wasn't going to be on TV anymore, about about 20% of the audience was like, all right, never mind, click. You Maybe know? it wasn't such a bad thing back in the day when we didn't know the ratings, you know? I mean, you only knew what got over by, like, whether you or your friends liked it. You're know? talking about it at the water cooler the next day at work or, yeah. or at school on the playground. Yeah, the ratings now really now were like irrelevant, though. Segment. Sorry, the, the, sorry Dan, go ahead. What was most important is, I mean, who cares what the ratings were in Memphis? If it, you know, if the Mid South Coliseum was sold out on Monday night, that's all that mattered. Yeah, and now it's we we take, but now, I mean, let's put it this way: we never were able to like isolate segments of you know, like God forbid, I mean, some of the early you know WWF like skits that were oh, just, breaking down like uncle elmer and like how did he do in the snl yeah exactly right. you don't have I get what you're like, saying sure yeah you know i mean you can't can you imagine you know when sd jones would have been was fighting uh 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 salvatore balomo you know you know you, you wouldn't exactly have some of the, the the i can only imagine how bad the ratings got then but then again there was only one wrestling show on at that point. You know, you, you took what you could get as opposed to, like, having so much wrestling now. You really can pick or choose and you can say, well, if this match doesn't excite you, then there's going to be, you know, what today there was a, the AEW show that, what, had 17 matches? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, they, uh, they're, I think I want to say it's including the pre-show. It was like, you're right, it was 15 or somewhere in that range. I mean, holy crap. I mean, yeah. you know, that that it used to take, you know, six months to watch 17 yeah. matches. I, and I think that, you mentioned I'm sorry to cut you off, but, but you mentioned earlier the, the clash at the castle. You know, that was because that was a great show. It had the right? old school pay-per-view feel. What was it? Five. I think it was five six or six matches. Match, six, six matches, six matches yeah. like, you know, a two at two at two and change hour. Big crowd. Yeah, you can argue about the main event ended. It was the wrong ending for that story. But um you know, you have that that difference, and now it's like what not. But the the year before they went to doing WrestleMania on two nights when it was in new it was in New York, New Jersey. The show ended at like one thirty in the morning, and was you know including the pre show was like over seven hours. And I remember that was actually they ended up having issues with that because the public transit ended before the show did. So you had you know seventy thousand people that didn't park that had problems getting home. <laughs> But the the entire premise of the product is different. Like back in the day, like when I watched WWF in the seventies, it was a series of squash matches. It was Billy Graham against Silvano Souza, and then you know uh, I don't know uh, Boba Brazil against a, a heel enhancement talent. The whole purpose was to build up the next card, and you know the, the next arena show. And now it's really it, it it's more to build up the next pay per view. So it's become. To me, it was more intimate. Like when you went to, if you lived in Memphis, you went to the Mid South Coliseum every Monday night. 
you got to watch Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, you know, Jimmy Valiant, the whole the whole gang. And now, I mean, like living in Tampa, I, I mentioned this one uh, on our podcast. I think it was last week. We might get wrestling in Tampa twice a year. It's become a long distance product. It's no longer intimate. You know, the the wrestlers back then they saw the same people fifty two weeks a year. You know, Jerry Lawler walking down the aisle in Memphis. I'm sure he could recognize. Probably knew some of the people on a first name basis. And that that's gone now. Absolutely. I mean, well, even here in the Bay Area, we don't get more than a couple of shows a year ourselves. So let alone Nebraska. Good well, luck. No. Good luck. You know what's funny is, uh, so I moved to the sticks from California, and when I was in California, like Buddy, I worked all over California doing indie wrestling shows, and I worked shots for everybody all over the state, and there was literally wrestling shows, like three or four different ones every weekend all over the place. I thought coming to Nebraska that it was going to be like, oh man, it's going to be super dry. No, man, I've been going to wrestling shows like crazy, taking my kid to go see shows for various different companies. Uh, the entertainment isn't huge out here. There's not a whole lot of it. Uh, we had micro wrestling come through not that long ago, and I took my son to that. That was a, that was a blast. Personally, and I was sitting there, and I was like, man, I've never actually been around midget wrestling. In all the years that I did uh, you know, wrestling announcing and promoting and everything. Um, and so I was like, wow, this is the first time I've ever been around midget wrestling in my life. And you can say midget wrestling, and it's okay. You're not going to get arrested or beat down. And uh, funny enough, the guy who was the promoter was a friend of mine from California. And I'm like, oh, what a small <laughs> world. So what finisher would you want to bring back the most? What's the finisher you guys miss miss the most? Bring back or get over? Get over. If it would be a, a finisher that people could really actually believe and you could finish a match with. The what DDT. do you think? The DDT. The, the DDT. Yeah. There, there was a time when Jake Roberts was using that finish and... I swear, I thought that was the most over finish in the business. When yep. he was doing it, like he got he would if Andre, if he got it on Andre the Giant, you knew he would beat Andre with it. You know, I mean, it was that over that that finish. And then it became, and I hate to blame the Andersons, the Andersons like Arn and Tully and stuff, they were using it as a transition. And it was like, oh, on one sh TV show, people are getting up right away from the DDT, and on the other show, if you hit with it, you're done. You're done. Well, they also wanted to make the Hurricane Rada DDT, you know, more powerful than the standing DDT. And that that got into prominence, you know. Oh, the it, tornado DDT? Yeah, and people started <laughs> doing it from the second rope and the yeah. third rope. So, you know, you couldn't just sell a standing DDT when you've got all these other variants of but it. You, but I think you can get it over, though. And, gentlemen, you guys you guys tell Russ and I, because Russ and I are older and, you know, a little dumber and stuff like that. You guys Not are older than Benny. Ones. Benny's, Benny's like dirt. He's I was being I, nice. You didn't I have tell to, him, I at my nice. age, I have to tell my carbon dating. So, no, I'm older than all you guys. <laughs> so, my point being, like, uh, you know, you guys say if, if there's a, a wrestling hold like that, a DT, it can get over. Right now, in WWE, in AEW, you can get it over merely by using it as a way to finish matches and to sell it like crazy. I mean, and you only need, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No, no, I'm finished. I'm finished. No, I was saying you only need somebody like, like the way, I mean, you could see some of the changes that, you know, with triple H running things now where you need somebody in the locker and to be like, look, um, you know, say, I don't know, let's pick somebody at random. Like, you know, Gunther's going to start doing, uh, a power bomb as his finisher so nobody else either either one nobody else does it or you're fined or fired or whatever or if you do it make it you know after the bell or that's that's the end of the match because if you have somebody like oh, you, all you got to do is come in and say look no uh you know no more ddts the only one that gets it is the guy that's doing it as his finisher or maybe if we can have you know like i think to uh you had a period with a couple of wrestlers two or three different variants, like the tornado DDT and Jake Roberts. Like maybe you have two or three guys doing different DDTs, but it's still a finisher. No more transition. I would say the same thing with the super kick. You know, I remember there was a period you had, you know, um, you had like uh, Chris Adams and, Chris and, Adams. and Shawn Fox Michaels. You, know, you had multiple it. people that did some form of the super kick and it was a finisher every time. Now you watch a young bucks match yeah. and you've got, 25 super kicks in the match. I mean, there it's literally a, they'll do a spot where the guys just sit there and super kick each other until one of them falls over like the, the, where they let each other, you know, slap their chests. Instead, they're doing super kicks. You come in, you say, look, you idiots don't get to do the super kick anymore. It's going to be his finisher and that's it. And 
fan wrestling fans having the incredibly long memories that they do, but also short attention spans will accept the super kick as a finisher quickly. You yeah, know? Russ, you got some smart friends. Gentlemen, I what is the name of your guys' podcast again? Because I'm gonna start listening. Because you guys have good ring. opinions. So Dan my, and Benny my, in the ring. My favorite was uh, because Bruno was my hero, was the Italian backbreaker, but my question is, what was Italian about it? Like when he was lifting up Luke Graham, was he ordering a pizza? Like why was it? <laughs> what made it Italian? Like like the Boston crab? Like was there a Sheboygan crab somewhere? Like how did they come up with the like full Nelson? We said it before the show. Like if it was a Jewish wrestler, was it a, a full Rabinowitz? Like where did they come up with these names? Absolutely, and I I personally. In the day of, of post kayfabe, it's impossible to sell the claw hold, but I love the claw. The oh. claw was like my favorite thing. When, when, when Baron Von Rasky came to the WWF and he did that claw hold, they had a big giant red X across the screen because I, I guess those. somebody was getting color. Yeah. Yes. You, and you know, it's funny you mentioned he was in the crowd, uh, uh, what, two months ago, maybe, at an AEW show. And he threw the claw on the little, you know, doofus manager guy. And the crowd went nuts. Like, here we are, 2022, you know. Um, I remember the legend, WWF did a, well, WWE did a, a Raw Legends show, I don't know, 15 years ago, whatever it was, years ago. And they had a bunch of people. And one of the people in the ring, you know, uh, as as the, the I want to say it was Rob Conway came out. And he's, you know, the arrogant heel and all you, all you fossils. And of course they all start Sergeant Slaughter and they all beat the crap out of them. And there's the Von Eric claw at the very end. The crowd yeah. goes nuts. Like you still love that, you know? So I was whole, there when think, Vader, when Vader ahead. debuted, Vader debuted in, uh, in California at a show right after the Royal Rumble, he ends up showing up at a raw taping and uh, he had some rib issues and he had to take some time off immediately. He did the rumble and then the next night and they needed a storyline reason for him not being on TV. And uh, Gorilla Monsoon was the president of the WWF at the time. And he had not done anything physical in 20 years. And all of a sudden he comes out and he starts telling Vader to get out of the ring. And he, he actually tried to get a little physical. Gorilla starts chopping the crap out of him. And I swear, I, I have been around Hogan, Andre, Warrior. It was the biggest pops I've ever heard. Was the crowd just erupting over Gorilla Monsoon, chopping Big Van Vader. It was amazing. Incredible. Over the, over the old guy, doing little chops. And it was like, holy crap. That's over. That's great stuff. Now, yep. that, that, that's a good transition to my next subject, which is... Um, one of the things that uh, that I did was uh, I interviewed the uh, the Stoner brothers who were uh, part of uh, Stoner University and Hood Slam out here in Northern California, and they wanted me to help bring along a guy who wants to become a manager. Okay, and and I know that they're out of vogue, but Hood Slam wants to you know reintroduce this guy, and he's he's kind of a Jim Cornette ish kind of you know Jimmy Hart sort of sort of you know, uh, 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 Johnny Polo type, you know, if we can go that back that far, and I think we all do. Um, uh, so I wanted to pick your guys' brains as to good advice as to what would make him a good manager. Now, I've already directed him towards watching all of Andy Kaufman's stuff. So he's seen I'm From Hollywood, and he's seen Breakfast with Blassie, okay? Thought that would really get him started, and it did. Okay. I also introduced him to Captain Lou Albano, who he didn't really know much about. And I said, that's a good way to understand how to give an interview, to give a promo, because I don't think anyone ever gave better promos than, <laughs> than Captain Lou Albano. I think he was the, the complete master of being able to just ramble, but eventually get back to a topic and control a microphone while his wrestler just stood there like this. You know, that was that was a great thing. And then I also had him watch Classy Freddy Blassie just to understand how you can work a crowd without ever working blue, without ever saying anything racial, without ever swearing. You could get people that wanted to kill you, you know, because I think very few people controlled heat like that. What else would you offer? Oh, and the other thing I had him read, uh, he's ordering a book of. Al Jaffe's Snappy Answers to Stupid Questions from Mad Magazine. I said, that will train you 
on how to respond quickly to fans that are throwing stuff at you. You throw those snappy answers to stupid questions right back at them, and they will be dumbfounded. So what other advice do you guys have? I, I would have country? him go old school, and although it's hard to find, find some tapes of Bobby Davis. Bobby Davis was the manager of Buddy Rogers back in the day when Buddy was the champion. And, and I think Jim Cornette, to me, is the reincarnation of Buddy, uh, Buddy um, Bobby Davis. He was Very only 22 similar. or 23 when he managed. And uh, I saw him in 1968. He was managing – the guy's name was John Quinn, but he was in the WWE. And that's a whole different subject as far as how the WWE booked, you know, booked uh, Bruno's matches. But he came in as Virgil the Kentucky Butcher. And anytime you wanted to generate heat with Bruno, you know, Arnold Skolan, the golden boy, was his manager. So there was a match between uh, Virgil Butcher and Arnold Skolan. And, uh, again, talking about a finishing move, Virgil used the pile driver. Every time he used the pile driver, the guy was stretchered out of the ring. So he, <laughs> he wrestles Skolan. Skolan gets pile driven. He's lying there. You know, the, the referee and a couple of whoever came out carrying Skolan out of the ring. Bobby Davis and Virgil Butcher – both at the same time lift the stretcher up and Skolan literally goes flying out of the ring, like over the top rope. And the next week on TV, Ray Morgan, the announcer for Capital Wrestling, gave the address for White Plains Hospital to send cards and letters, you know, to wish Arnie a speedy recovery. And then they had, you know, they had Bruno on and you know, like Bruno never, I mean, the, 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 the most he would say would be dog on it. But like, man, he was pissed off. And I, I got to tell you, that, that garden was sold out. And that's how they did it. But Bobby Davis was a legendary manager. And I would say, you know, he's one of the true greats. And not a lot is, is said about him because it's a little bit, you know, back in time. But he was a great manager. Yeah, if we're, if we're recommending tape and saying, OK, to this young guy who's just getting started, go and watch some of these older managers. Bobby Davis is actually a great answer. Uh, I got to tell you, there's another one that comes to mind. If you've never seen Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Ron Wright is one of the greatest yes. acts I've ever seen, along with Dirty White Boy. I swear there's so much tape out there on the Peacock Network right now. You can go watch Ron Wright. When he was a performer and then later a manager, some of the best heat I've ever seen in my life. What I would suggest to this young guy is watch these guys. Watch these guys and see what worked, what didn't work. Find your own way. Don't go and copy what Bobby Heenan did. You're never going to be Bobby Heenan. You're never going to be Jim Cornette. You know, but maybe you could be a new, different version of those kind of guys that have, that have paved the way for you. And don't be afraid of the heat. Embrace the hell out of it. Also, don't try to overshadow your guy, whomever it is that you're managing, whether it's a male or female or tag team. Yeah, 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 that's that's yeah. like probably the most important is you know pick your spots. Know when it's appropriate to go out there and get heat. But when he's working in the ring, you don't want to be a doing a whole lot of jaw jacking with the crowd, taking the attention off of your performer. It's really all about him. You want to accentuate him. So when you're talking about, hey, this Sunday, you're going to have the opportunity of a lifetime. Buddy Satello's in the ring, and I'll tell you what, man, he's been training, he's been lifting weights, he's eating sandwiches that are just ginormous, my friend. And when you get in the ring with him, he's going to treat you like that sandwich. He's going to take the lettuce off of you if you get what I'm drifting, huh? You know, you know you're putting over that the guy, not me, is going to just destroy you and then allow the guy to stand there and look good and flex his muscles and and you know accentuate that guy to where that's all you're thinking about he, this guy's going to kill him and i really hope that that when when they get the opportunity buddy gets his butt kicked <laughs> you know it usually happens i would say any any video out there to go find go find the bloody white suit jim Cornette promo following yes him his turn it was the brief face run of the midnight oh. express where he's talking you know uh uh, con, you know, uh, e uh stan lane and eaton tag team of the year you know that we were never like that with contrary basically you know we carried your fat pathetic and he goes in and it was the brief moment where you you get like okay this is clearly Cornette talking you see his feel for the people like you get how much he cares about his team you get how angry he is that his guys got wronged and then I would say go and I mean, there's not really managers are kind of a lost art in today's wrestling, Absolutely. but go watch some of what passes for managers today. And then go watch, like you said, Bob, you know, Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, go watch some of those guys. Cause you see, you know, there's, 
Mr. Perfect with with a forearm, Bobby Heenan with the quick slap, you know, just kind of leans in on the apron or Cornette slides and, and hits the tennis racket. The whole thing takes a few seconds. Nowadays, you watch the manager gets on the apron. He's talking. The ref clearly has to turn around for two weeks while something happens behind him. You can hear the clanking of chairs and God knows what. And the ref has to be a blind idiot because managers don't know how to how to work the pace. Uh, if you want to get any good advice on being a good manager, go watch some of the old tapes for how important good timing is because that's the heat. If I jump on the apron and I'm jaw jacking with the ref, the fans know you're cheating. It, it's, it doesn't get the same heat as a quick, you know, slap or uh, Bobby Heenan holding the foot down to finally beat the ultimate warrior. Like that it was just a, that whole that whole segment took five seconds from the suplex to the pin, bam, done. Heenan's a, a I, I want to jump the barrier and kill him. And he did so little as far, but the main focus was still on the talent, like you said. But I mean, you gotta you gotta get the timing down because the problem I think what really hurt the modern manager is they don't know they don't know how to manage, and it ends up I, I hate to use the word, but it looks phony because in order when the when they jump on the apron or they distract the ref for ten minutes, it makes it makes the entire segment look stupid. If it, well, the way that I'm gonna do it with him is I'm. I'm sort of doing them in segments, you know. I, I feel like there's there's different types of managers. And I think there's something to be borrowed from every single one. There's there's you know the the over the top like Andy Kaufman, uh, Jimmy Hart, Jim Cornette, you know, pestering fly type manager. Then you have like the the uh, the physical, brooding kind of like ex wrestler manager, you know, like a Freddie Blassie, you know, or an Albano Mr. type Mr. thing. But then I think there's also like the sinister planner. And that's I was gonna go over with him on on this week on the sinister planner. Someone like Gary Hart, for instance. You oh, know that's a good one. The, yeah. That or, or you know there's the Grand there's Wizard. Guys, I'm sorry, the Grand Wizard was the other one I was gonna like have him talk about. It's like guys that you can see are working behind this Heenan was a sinister planner. Even though he was an over-the-top insulter, you know, people always felt there was something going on with him and he was always headed towards someone. J.J. Dillon, there's another mm -hmm. sinister planner type, you know? And I'm going to keep working him on these different segments. And, and so I think that the best thing you can do as a manager is to borrow from all these different things, especially because what I've always said to, 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 to my uh, student is that What's old is new again. And most people don't watch 40-year-old tapes or anything like that. So if you can buy now, if you just take something completely from somebody's gimmick and just apply it to yourself, that's not, not creative. But if you take a smorgasbord of little pieces from all these different spots and put them together, then you're a genius. Now, just for full disclosure, you have to have them watch the uh, Lou Albano, uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker cage match. To see what happens to the manager at the very end. Oh yeah. Well, that's... don't ruin it for the kid right now. You got to, you know, let him not know that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> he might drop right. out. He he's not going to end up in an in a actual weasel costume getting his his head stomped in. Well, what there there was a time there was a time Russ that Russ was doing a show, uh, Buddy still was doing a show, and uh, Rikishi was going to stink face him, and Russ said, "I don't want to get stink faced. I I don't really want to do that finish or that spot." And so there was a younger manager, and he goes, he'll he'll do it, you know, he'll he'll do it. And so he made somebody else take the stink face. And so Russ was telling me like some of the wrestlers got upset with him, and he's like, hey man, should, you know, they were kind of wanting that guy to put his butt in my face and and everything else. And Rikishi got mad, and I'm like, Russ, I would have just taken the stink face myself, or just you know, you just you're not gonna get to do it all. And he's like, but it's butt in my face, you know. That's why you made the kid do it, you know. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Plus, I, I've gotten to the point where I don't want any kind of bumps anymore. And the thought of, so, you know, two, 300 pounds of just blubber, you know, smashing me in the face didn't sound all that appealing. Plus, look, I took Betty Beefcake's uh, biscuits and gravy a number of times, the female manager. So, you know. That was my dating life in the 90s, dude. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody needs love. So. <laughs> oh, it's a little local humor for you guys. Uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, okay. So, you know, I also think this is a great time to address the concept of booking. Because I think all three of you guys are booking geniuses from when I've talked to you. You know, I think that 
and 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 we're seeing kind of a, a sea change going on in wrestling now that Vince McMahon, I think, is on the shelf. Let's, and John Laurinaitis is on the shelf. I think those two guys were really just killing the entire attitude of the WWE. I think AEW also hit kind of a kind of a pit with uh, COVID, and they're getting themselves back out of it. Where do you think booking should be headed towards today? What are your thoughts? I, I think that uh, one thing that's sorely missing is enhancement talent. I mean, everybody swaps wins nowadays. And you really, you know, back in the day, like the whole idea of the TV show was to have all the, you know, the, whether it be babyface or heel, face an enhancement talent, look, you know, invulnerable. And that's going to get them ready for the next card. And now it's, I mean, everybody's got a 500 record. I, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I, I, I got to agree 100%. I feel like the 50-50 booking that WWE was doing for a long time, it was to not make anybody too strong and not make anybody too weak. So you have Dolph Ziggler win one week and then lose the next week and vice versa, back and forth. You're never making anybody really strong. So you need those guys like Dolph Ziggler, who's great at going out there. I'm just using him as an example. That's good at going out there and making the other people look great. So that's why enhancement talent is so important. So when Cody came into WWE, he was riding this incredible wave. He's the first major star from AEW and from the beginning of AEW to come to WWE. And he came in riding a lightning bolt, baby, because he had the world behind him. He shows up at Mania. He's got that incredible debut. He gets a victory over Seth. They set up a rematch. And I was really concerned. Man, they're gonna they're gonna try to even it up for Seth and get Seth a victory. And as a booking mind, I'm looking at it and going, not the time, man. But yeah, you want to keep Seth strong, but I would not have Cody lose right now. You need to have that guy not lose anything for a long time. And when he does make it mean something in that run, because personally, I want to see him go to Mania and win that title. You know, I mean, after that speech he gave on Raw, like I believe in the guy, and I'm I'm invested in the story that they were telling. And it's just unfortunate that he got hurt. They ended up doing the third match, and I thought, man, they're going to screw him. And they didn't. Again, they let him win, and he told an even better story because he had these blackened uh, pectoral oh, muscle. Yeah. That's just, it was disgusting to look at. But at the same, and you know, like, they can't do any more damage to it right now. He, his damage is already gone. But they beat the crap out of it. And for just a little bit, me and a lot of other wrestling fans were able to suspend a little bit of disbelief. Because you right. can't fake that stuff with makeup. It was real. And yeah. you're like, oh, my God, he's getting the crap kicked out of him. And May shouldn't be performing right now. And then he ends up winning. And it's like, you know what? He goes off into the sunset temporarily. And when he comes back, it's going to be gangbusters. He's coming back full steam ahead into that story looking for the title. Had he lost once or twice to Seth, I don't think he would have been as strong. And I don't think that people would have been as invested in that story. So 50-50 booking kills a lot of that storytelling by trying to keep everybody strong. Nobody's getting strong, right. if that makes any sense. No, yes, you're does. completely right. And, and I mean, he, 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 when he comes back, he's already top baby face in the company, no questions asked. I think you talk about booking. Uh, Benny, he mentioned the enhancement talents. That's a great idea. The other thing with the enhancement talents, I, I look at like... Um, Something like a like AEW has their dark and their elevation shows. That's what your your Monday and Wednesday night, third Friday. That's what those shows should be. It should be your your main talent because if, if you have your guys going, and that's the other thing that that people forget about. If you have the enhancement matches, you know, a bunch of enhancement matches every week, you don't need a massively bloated roster where you have to have 10 hours of programming a week just to put everybody on TV. You can mm -hmm. have 12 or 15 guys and build from it and if i watch say you know somebody like uh uh i don't know you you mentioned like dolph ziggler i watch dolph ziggler go out every week and beat up some local jobbers when he finally goes to the pay-per-view and gets you know uh i don't know say drew mcintyre claymore's his head off and you know I, he, dolph ziggler doesn't walk away from that match looking weak it, because i've just you know obviously mcintyre was the bet was the better bigger guy but I've also seen you know you're you're you've seen you win. You watch AW has the ratings. Somebody comes out for a title match and their their record this year is twenty four and seventeen. 
that's that's and and that and they're talking about it like that's a great thing. Like, wait a minute, hang on, no, you you can't lose three times a month and still be a cha- you know a champion. You got guys, uh, the Ultimate Warrior that comes up a lot. Where it was in his entire WWE run, he won almost 90 percent of his matches it's like 80 something percent you know he had a better win rate win rating than hogan did and so you got to have to build the talent the other thing is you got to have the realism again and i don't mean that in in the sense of pretend you know kayfabe genie in the bottle i mean cm punk comes out and he cuts a promo and i believe what he's saying and you know we, we were just talking about clash in the castle earlier drew mcintyre you know he comes out it's his home country i i'm behind him in the story you feel that emotion this you know uh you spilled my coffee so tomorrow so next week we're gonna have a texas death match I, right. i'm not invested <laughs> in that you know oh, not even next week it's later on tonight yeah we're gonna yes. get we're gonna get the you know, and, and without talking to anybody Right, and that's something that Cornette harps on a lot on his podcast. With oh, I haven't seen it as much. I give Triple H credit for cleaning that up too. But like Monday Night Raw, you know, uh, it opens. Seth Rollins comes out and he starts talking, and somebody comes out and is like, "Well, that's it. We're gonna we're gonna have a match tonight." Wait, you booked a show and you've got thirty minutes open, like to throw a, ma- a match together during you know right. during the opening. Like I know that happens, but if if, if Ninety percent of your card is generated in story that night. What did you what 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 did you plan on doing if these two guys didn't talk? You know, if Chris Jericho didn't spill his coffee, what 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 was supposed to take up the fifteen minutes after this commercial break? Like, you know, you need that that almost um oh uh help me out. What was his name? Uh, uh Jack Tunney. You know, you need him to to. We're gonna cut to the president. All right. Next week, you two are going to re- wrestle, and you've got somebody. Or, hey, we had a match schedule. If we're going to put it next week. You two are going to fight tonight. You know, at least present it like there was something in place, and and you build a little more of that realism. And I think fans and the ratings reflect that fans get behind that. Yeah, and they'll be educated by it by doing that kind of stuff. I, I'm not a big fan of the, um, you know, the storyline general managers and the you know authority figures and stuff. But I did love the way that Tunney was done in the WWE because it was like every once in a while you dust him off and then he has like a little, you know, a little thing where he ends up saying something and all of a sudden he's going to be so serious. Yeah, you know, he was always one, serious. Uh, it's a hard Absolutely. Attack. There was no humor to it. There was no like a uh, tongue in cheek, you know, to it or anything like that. And you you kind of believed it because he looked like kind of a president, you know, would look, you think, of, of the yeah. WWE, you know? So and he had papers on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he, he, he actually had a desk in an office. And he had it a desk. Right. It wasn't obviously, you know, a, a folding table in the corner of a locker room. And it wasn't overturned by a contract signing. <laughs> now, here's my booking idea. And this is this, with the WWE. I really think I would like to see three titles. And that's it. Three men's titles, two women's titles. That's it. You have the world title, you have the intercontinental title, you have the tag team titles, and that's it. And you have real, you know, guys really care if they get the belts, you know, instead of just like, well, if I don't get this belt, I'll get the U.S. belt, or I'll get the intercontinental belt, or I'll get the title, or I'll get the next championship. Triple H is doing a great job because he's trying to elevate the mid-card titles, and I actually talked about it on my show um, I, I do a show, the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. We do it each and every week. And so we talk a little bit of current events, but we also, you know, I talk about stuff like that. And I said seven or eight months ago, I would love to see them elevate the mid-card titles, unify the singles championships to where there's only one world champion, and then make that world champion kind of like Hogan. You never saw Hogan back in the day on TV. You'd see him, you know, show up and do interviews. You might see him wrestle once a year on television, and that was it. And it wasn't that I preferred Hogan's style of wrestling, but it was that world champion meant so much. It was the same thing in the territory days when Flair showed up with that with the 10 pounds of gold. It was a big deal, and it was a boost to have the world champion in the territory fighting a Jerry Lawler or you know a Nick Bockwinkel or whatever it was. And so and f- I said, unify the titles and make the mid-card titles mean more and that those are kind of the top of the card stuff. And it looks like a lot of the times the intercontinental fights would be better than the world title fights. I okay. mean, if you yeah, look absolutely. back on, yep. on some of the history of the intercontinental championship matches, 
they're more fun and I look back on them with greater nostalgia than I do, you know, just about any of that, that mid eighties, you know, when you had Tito Santana, and you had uh, Greg Valentine, yeah. hold it. You had the honky tonk man, Barocco. have it. You had <laughs> Macho man, have it. You had Bret it's supposed Hart. supposed to be the greatest it. intercontinental I mean, champion of all time. I don't know if you knew that or not. HTM. Yes, sir. We're, we're coming uh, up on, I mean, you figure we're not too far year wise from WrestleMania 40 and people still talk about Savage Steamboat WrestleMania 3 is the greatest WrestleMania match ever. And that was an intercontinental title match. Yeah. And people don't, you know, bring up the Hulk Hogan, King Kong Bundy steel cage match that I happen to be at for WrestleMania 2. Nobody brings that one up as one of the great matches of all time. Although I remember it as they, one. They, just they don't bring it up because it wasn't, but that's beside the point. They bring At it up because it was in the big blue cage. That's the only reason it oh, ever gets yes. brought up. I, I do. That's something too. You need to bring back the big blue cage. I'm sure. I'm sure the uh, the chain link is much softer to fall into. But something about that big blue cage. And stop painting Helen itself red. That looks oh, I hate terrible. It. I hate it. That's that. And I think a as. as we were talking about the one uh, the one piece that's also missing is commentary. You you need your commentators to call the match like it's a real match and not spend half the match talking about Sprite or whatever the hell, you know, some crazy, you know. Or or if you're gonna do that, just have one Art Donovan on your show asking, you know, how yeah. much does this guy weigh at least three or four oh. times a match? The uh, worst the worst commentary I've ever heard like, of all time. Uh, that's why I really like Pat McAfee. Right. You're not like including what? Michael Cole in any of that stuff? I mean... Right. It's vintage, though. It's vintage. You know yeah. what? I, Michael Cole is probably the best example of the change in leadership because his commentary has Thank improved you. a thousand percent since Triple H took over. And Benny and I, we've spent entire shows talking about how much Michael Cole sucks. So yeah. I, that's my... And I, <laughs> I'm the first to say he's gotten so much better. You take Vince out of his ear and just let him talk. And the chemistry with him and Pat McAfee is, is incredible. It's great. And you know what? They have become the best team in wrestling right now. And Pat McAfee is fantastic. He really, he is. really is. He's so different. And he's so fun. And like you listen to him and you know that he's having a blast. And it helps you to enjoy it and lose yourself a little bit. And and like they're saying, the moment that you got Vince out of out of Michael Cole's ear, he's really been fantastic. He really has. It's been night and day difference as of late. Yeah. And I, I give him credit just a f- uh, few weeks ago when, um, what was the, um, I'm trying to remember the the match. It was uh, the pay-per-view. It was, you know, when Pat McAfee was uh, wrestling. And it was him and Corbin. Corey Graves. Yeah. yeah. And, and Corey Graves told told Michael Cole, he's like, man, Michael Cole, I liked you a lot better when you weren't allowed to have an opinion. And Michael Cole, Michael Cole straight up was like, yeah, well, a lot of things have gotten better in the past few weeks. Like, you know, wow. oh, OK. Wow. Do you think do you think, though, that all of this is in some way just killing Vince McMahon? Because like now that he's out of it, you know, he's seeing things improving. And that's like he in his heart, he wanted to see everything go completely to hell when he when he's gone and everyone come back and beg him to come back. Do you think he's just going to go out of his mind, like saying, I got to get back into wrestling because everyone's going to forget about me if I don't get back in? No, I don't think anybody's ever going to forget about him. And I and I don't think he needs to come back. And I don't know if he really wants to come back right now with everything that's going on. One thing, there's an interview that Triple H recently did. I think it was with Ariel Hawani, and he sat down with them, and he said that Vince told him, like, look, you're not going to do everything the way that I did it, you know, and you have to find your own way and do it your way. You don't want to think, how would Vince do that? Because once you do that, it's not going to be organic, and it's not going to be real. You do you might get things. you might get thrown in prison, so. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. probably. But no, I, I I like that he's doing it his way, and you know what? Um, it looks like the ratings are up. It looks like you know the morale is up. It wasn't so long ago, guys, that AEW was riding this crest, this wave of popularity, and it was Mick Foley mentioned it on a podcast that it was the first time in history that people that are just getting into the wrestling business were wanting to go to AEW, not WWE. WWE was seen as you know what? They're going to ruin me when I get there. I've worked my entire life to, to do this as a living, and they are going to ruin me because of their presentation of good characters and great wrestling. 
and I don't fit the mold of what they want, and they're going to put scripted garbage in my mouth. And so everybody's wanted to go to AEW. Now all the people that left the WWE over the last year are clamoring to leave, reportedly, allegedly, are clamoring to leave AEW and get out of their contract so they can go back to WWE with Triple H involved. We've heard you know, rumors about that going on with Miro, Rusev, uh, Malachi Black, Aleister Black back in WWE, and uh, Keith Lee also has been rumored to have the desire to get out of his contract and go back to WWE now that Triple H is in charge. So they realize like, hey, it's a real wrestling product over on the other side. In fact, they're even using the word wrestling, that dirty, yeah. dirty word. They're using it on TV. And titles. Yeah. yeah. So and even even the uh, WWE shop section, it now says you can buy WWE titles instead of championships. I love it. Wait the till they top- start saying belts. Yeah. Right. The right. Topic I want to put, put, the, up, put the strap up. Now, yeah. now that I need to hear somebody call it a strap, and we'll be all set. Yes. Um, now the other the other uh, topic that I wanted to bring up, you know, well we still have a couple minutes, is uh, kind of the the mysterious case of Thunder Rosa. You know, I mean, I actually had got the ability to work a show with her a long time ago, and when she was just starting out, I thought she was a very fine person to talk to. Very talented, very capable <laughs> lady, but you know she is really like I don't know what's going on. I mean, is it her? Is it the situation that she keeps getting into at these different feds? She's not able to ever. She gets hurt a lot, and and then these feds that are trying to push her seem to then push her under the rug. Or what do you think? She puts herself under the rug. So I, I actually know Melissa. I actually worked with her when she first started out, when she was training at AEW or AAPW. Um, she was just a student and she was a very sweet kid, unbelievably nice, unbelievably upbeat and positive. And unfortunately, the promoter of the company, Roland Alexander, passed away and she had already paid for all of her schooling and she was only like halfway through. So when he passed away and the school closed down, she was out all the money. And she had to go and pay someone else to train her. She tried very hard to get in the wrestling business. She's got such a great personality. I think that she's very proud about how hard she works. And she's got a lot of experience all over the world at all these different places. She got over wherever she's been so far. Uh, When she was doing this stuff with the NWA a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, she was the most over female performer in the program. Um, she came to AEW and riding like a huge wave. She's done phenomenal. The problem is with her, she gets hurt very easily. And it seems like it's one of those toys that Tony plays with. And then he grows tired of fairly quickly. And he goes like, ah, well, I'm done with that toy. And I'm going to move on to the next thing. Uh, you know, we all think he does coke, right? I don't know if you guys know this or not. We all think he does a lot of coke. He's pretty coked out. He's pretty excitable. Or he's like snorting up the Ritalin, the uh, ADHD meds. Because the guy is all over the place when it comes to, you know, having these scrums. And he's just like, oh, I don't know. Oh, well, the thing was, was and he's like, you're like, calm down, dude. Just have a normal conversation. You're fine. Um, he gets all excitable about like a, a Claudio coming in. And Claudio is the hot new property, right? And for a few weeks, you're seeing him prominently put out on TV. They're giving him ample TV time. They're talking about him. They're talking him up. And then pretty soon he's relegated to dark elevation. You know, it kind of reminds point. me of Vince. I mean, Vince used to do that also in his Cub days. You know? Yeah, I, I, I think a, a little different in that that Vince always had the shiny new toy. And you'd hear, you know, he'd, he, they'd call somebody up from NXT. And within a week or two, they're they're being jobbed out because Vince uh, lose, uh, Vince lost interest or or Kevin Dunn or one of those Ascension. other cronies. Ahem What's that? Ascension. Ahem the Ascension. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think with Tony Khan, I think Claudio is a great example in that he pushed him prominently, and then now obviously he's the Ring of Honor champion because I think, and and I'm not saying he's right, but I think in Tony's mind. I push these guys. They did it with Samoa Joe and the, and the television title. You know, we put these guys front and center for a little while. And then eventually when Ring of Honor gets its own TV slot, because right now it's still uh, just, you know, ran, like they'll randomly have a Ring of Honor title match on AEW. Uh, you know, uh, then we can we can have these guys. Plus, Tony Khan's in the same problem that, that Vince was a few years ago in that 
they have a massive roster and like like you were saying you know too many damn belts and titles and now that, and then tonight they just crowned a, a three man tag team and uh you know there there's <clears throat> I wouldn't be shocked if they end up with a women's trios title eventually well, well they have two two singles women's championships uh, they don't have a tag championship yet, but I'm sure that's coming. The yeah. trio's title is the new All Atlantic champion. The what's their yeah. what's their TV title? The the, uh, the, the TNT TBS, title. The T- TNT. They got yeah. the TBS title over on the other. The females. Thing. It's just too many title belts. And when you have you know a picture of all the performers that are on your roster, and you know 78 percent of them have championship belts. Yeah, they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything at no, all. You're absolutely right, Benny. Yeah. Benny, your thoughts? I'm going to go a little bit off topic. I I want to talk about, it it seems like you have to, if you love WWE, you have to hate hate AEW or vice versa. And I don't know why that is. I'm I'm going to go back to when I was younger and growing up in, you know, New York, we had WWF. Well, I guess it was around 75, 76. All of a sudden we got wrestling from Los Angeles, from the Olympic. And and it was my first WTF moment because the star out there was Jabba Rook. I'm like, damn, that looks just like Johnny Rods. Got the same mm. boots and everything. And I, but it can't be because like Johnny and but we got that. And then I, I guess a year or so later, now I'm getting CWF from Florida with Gordon Soley. And I I never thought to look to myself, well, I, I have to just pick one and stick with it. I mean, I look bring it on. The more the merrier. And I don't know why, like, it, it just seems like you go on Facebook, you you got to be on one side or the other. I don't know why that has to be. I agree 100%. I love everything. But I also hate everything. Like, I, there's something for me to dislike about each of them. But there's something for me to love about each of them. It's like when you go to the circus, you don't, you don't just go because you want to see the trapeze artist. You might like watching the fat lady with the beard. Or you might want to watch the uh, the clowns. I mean, there's something for everybody. And I think that's at every company. There was a time about four or five months ago when I thought AEW was doing fantastic. Now, I was unhappy with some of the dumb things they do. But I thought, man, they're doing great stuff. MJF is fantastic. There's a lot of really young talent. They're getting over, like, the four pillars of AEW. They've got these four young guys they're kind of building around for the future. And I thought, man, they're doing it right they're really getting them over. They're making them strong. They're not having MJF lose all the time and just using him as an example. Uh, but then all of a sudden, it just seems like their booking has kind of gone off the cliff and they're overrun with all this talent. So it's too frenetic. They're not able to concentrate on a certain sect of people like Paul Heyman did with SmackDown back in 0203 when he's like, OK, I got a sweet six. And with this six guys, I'm going to put these guys over they're my top stars so he made the whole tv about these six performers and it's like you're you're angling it for something for a reason and aew has kind of lost that as of late they're just kind of all over the place and then wwe who's been all over the place for a while with vince's booking has all of a sudden kind of really honed down and gotten really sharp over the last few weeks so i I love them all i I watch nwa mlw I watch all of the different companies, but I think that there is a sect of people out there that are like, I only watch WWE or I only watch AEW. And I think that if you're limiting yourself to that, you're missing out on a lot of great content. I'm a wrestling fan, not, not a WWE fan or an AEW fan. But it's it's true. It's there. It's that there is that line, especially with the Internet. I think just as we've evolved as a species, we've become more bipolar and we've said you either love this or you hate this. There isn't room for, you know, you you can't just drink Pepsi and or Coke, you know, when you feel like it. You have to always drink Coke. You have to always drink Pepsi. You have to always go to Burger King. You have to always go to McDonald's or you're some kind of anti-loyalist because unless you you grab onto your product and hold on to it for dear life and never look at anything else, you're a traitor to that cause. Do you think there's there's that underlying sort of feeling? I think that's what you're getting to. Yeah, and it, if your friend switches from Coke to Pepsi, now he's not your friend anymore. Exactly. Mm. exactly. Yeah, it's almost like you guys are talking about politics because it's pretty right. much the same damn uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's un- like you can't un- be can't be in the middle. <laughs> you be unrelated, 
unrelated side note, Benny, if I see a Pepsi can during our next show, you're fired. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is the only thing I've got that's cool. Oh, I've got a, a, a Pepsi Max. I'm a Diet Cup drinker, but... Well, I, I can't. I can't judge too much. I, I drink Pepsi myself, so. So now, finally, the most pressing issue of all. I saved it for the very end. What happened to the Misters in wrestling? Yes. Used to have so many different Misters out there. Mister Wonderful, Mister Perfect, Mister Fuji, Mister X, Mister Wrestling. What happened? Mister Ass. Yes, Mr. <laughs> Ass, thank you very much. Mr. Electricity, you brought him up. Steve How about Regal. Mr. Kennedy? Mr. Kennedy. And that was what probably the, the last happened? great one. That was probably the last great one was Mr. Kennedy. And I think it's like the manager thing. It's like it becomes passe or they've done it so many times. And then Vince has had it in his craw that we don't want to do that anymore. And then that just, you don't, you don't say belt because that's what holds up your pants, pal. You know, and, and you don't you don't say championship. It's a title, and it's a title opportunity. And and so he had some of those weird tropes that he didn't want to repeat. Oh, that's that's hokey wrestling. You know, we're sports entertainment, pal. You know, and so things like calling somebody Mister or having like the big masked monster, it's kind of passe now. Unfortunately, I think with Triple H and with Tony Khan, you're going to see more of that kind of old school stuff come in. Hopefully, uh, and we'll see a little more of it. Um, I hope that we don't next week have like three misters out there yeah. because they listen to this show. But you well, know. ironically, he was Mr. McMahon, right? Yeah. And and you're already seeing some of the changes with both uh, Austin Theory and Matt Riddle getting their full names back at the at the recent recent billings. So, you know, because that was first it was we didn't want nicknames. We didn't want goofy characters. Then it's like I, I don't want first names at all. You know, because it was, uh, I remember like Alexander Rusev and Antonio Cesaro, names right. like that that just kind of went away. Um, but, I, and you could, you saw that with the unfortunate break with Bray Wyatt with when the, how over the fiend got. Vince and his crew had absolutely no idea what to do with a gimmick that wasn't The Undertaker. Like, you know, we, I mean, well, but at that point, with them, which is fire him. That's he was grandfathered was. in, but I mean, yeah, I, I, here's <clears> this <throat> unkillable monster who's we're gonna have him lose a hell in a cell match by ref stoppage because he got beat up too badly. Like, well, there goes that. There goes that idea. And, you and know, th that thanks for Firefly, playing. that Firefly Funhouse thing when COVID was happening at WrestleMania uh, in 2020, when they did the Firefly Funhouse match with him and John Cena, I, I was like, oh, it's gonna be so bad. There's no crowd. What they did with that thing was so spectacular. And it was one of those like, man, that guy is so creative. And what a good piece of business they did using yep. Cena saying, I'm going to get rid of uh, the most overhyped, overused, you know, and they, you know, played that over. And it's like, oh, he's talking about himself. Oh, he's talking about Cena. Like it was masterful storytelling. And that whole character and the rise and everything was fantastic. But it was like once they got him there, it's like Vince kind of forgot how to keep that performer fresh and over. Really, that kind of performer is an attraction, like Undertaker right. would be used, like the Andre the Giant would be used as an attraction. You don't want to have that person on TV each and every week. Because yeah, I mean, even just, even peak Attitude Era, when the Undertaker was a multi-time champion, he wasn't on Raw and SmackDown every week. You might have a backstage vignette, or Paul. They'd have an interview with Paul Bearer, and you'd see some shadow in the background. But the Undertaker didn't wrestle every week. He wasn't there every week. And then that was the whole thing with fifty-fifty booking: was we can't build the Fiend up as this unstoppable monster because we're going to put him in a feud and I'm not going to have Seth Rollins lose three times in a row. So he's got to, you know, we got to beat him at least once. And it's like, well, that self-defeating, you know, imagine, I mean, that's the WrestleMania 14 when, when the undertaker finally beat Kane, that was a huge deal because Kane was an unstoppable monster. If he'd lost three or four times before that match, that entire feud is pointless. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, Benny, you got any other thoughts for us? Well, I was going to say, you know, one thing that has disappeared that I think would be very helpful with booking would be the use of draws, countouts, uh, DQs, and maybe stoppages due to blood loss. Because that was a way of protecting people, having them lose without really losing. When uh, when uh, Lex Luger had uh, Ric Flair in a torture rack, 
and a referee stopped the match because of excessive blood loss. So Luger, he lost the match, but I mean, he didn't he didn't look weak. And don't forget throwing someone over the top row as a disqualification. <laughs> and I still am waiting for the match that's concluded because someone used an open fist and was disqualified. I want I I, I always wanted to do that in CCW was to have like this incredible like de- like a, a death match that went 60 minutes because at the very end at like 59 59 the guy uses a closed fist the ref disqualifies him at 59 59 and he'd have to count to five the, first though yeah right yeah I, I think the worst one ever was mid south when you got disqualified if you jumped off the top rope but one time somebody got away with it because Bill Watts said he didn't jump off the top rope. He leapt off the top rope. What the hell's the difference? What? <laughs> That's goofy. You know, I did hear that the reason that, that Watts liked that rule, and he tried to use it after Mid-South when he came to WCW for a little while. And I felt it killed the territory a little bit when he was running because they had such a great junior heavyweight division at the time with Liger and uh, Brad Armstrong uh, Brian Pillman, and he came in and he said, no more jumping off the top rope. He liked the idea of referees turn turn their back and for the heat, jumping off the top rope as like a heat getting thing. And, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of it. I felt like it kind of took away, but he did have a point behind it. Like it'll mean more when they go and do the move and all of a sudden they get some heat because they did it behind the referee's back and they got the finish or whatever. They get caught and they get disqualified. But yeah, more disqualifications and more countouts. I'm all for it. If if we're getting a vote right now, I, yeah, I'm saying all for it. Do we when we vote right now? Does that mean yes. that we're going to start doing yeah, it on yeah, TV? I, okay, even sure. The draw, yes, Tommy, Tommy Connie's listening right away. He's one of our uh, 50 viewers. So you know. Uh, uh, anyway, guys, I couldn't have had more fun in this hour. This was. I can't believe it's been over an hour. I could go another hour with you guys, except that it's 105 still. Here in California, so I'm, I'm I'm totally sweltering. But I'd love to have you guys back on the show again. But why don't you guys promote your podcast, all three of you guys, so here and 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 let people know how they can get a hold of you through social media. Well, you guys can always reach me over at JJ Purdom on Twitter. I'm there constantly. I'm not very good at it, and I probably will never respond to any of your tweets. But you can also reach me at Suplex City Pod, and you can catch me each and every week at the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. It's kind of a hokey name, but I figured it's going to catch wrestling uh, smarky marks attention. We talk wrestling, uh, all kinds of different wrestling stuff, and we always use like a main event of every show where we talk about something fun, like, hey, let's talk about a topic like the first WrestleMania. So we go back and watch WrestleMania. We talk about it on the, on the broadcast. And you guys go ahead and promote your show. Well, we're Dan and Benny in the ring. Uh, anywhere podcasts can be listened to. We also have the Dan and Benny in the ring Facebook page, which is very active. Uh, a lot of good names come in and out of there. We get some fan interaction with some uh, wrestling talent, as well as writers and um, other names that come through. And uh, we, like I said, anywhere podcast can be listened to uh, our episodes post Tuesday nights, Dan and Benny in the ring. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being on this week. Have a good holiday weekend and we'll have you all on the show again very soon. You've been wonderful guests. Good night, everybody.